Chapter 13 Choices Before they went to sleep, Moraine knelt by each in turn and laid her hands on their heads. Lan grumbled that he had no need, and she should not waste her strength. But he did not try to stop her. Egwene was eager for the experience, Matt and Perrin clearly frightened of it, and frightened to say no. Tom jerked away from the Aes Sedai's hands, but she seized his gray head with a look that allowed no nonsense. The gleeman scowled through the entire thing. She smiled mockingly once she took her hands away. His frown deepened, but he did look refreshed. They all did. Rand had drawn back into a niche in the uneven wall where he hoped he would be overlooked. His eyes wanted to slide closed once he leaned back against the timber jumble, but he forced himself to watch. He pushed a fist against his mouth to stifle a yawn. A little sleep, an hour or two, and he would be just fine. Moraine did not forget him, though. He flinched at the coolness of her fingers on his face and said, I don't... His eyes widened in wonder. Tiredness drained out of him like water running downhill. Aches and soreness ebbed to dim memories and vanished. He stared at her with his mouth hanging open. She only smiled and withdrew her hands. It is done, she said, and as she stood with a weary sigh, he was reminded that she could not do the same for herself. Indeed, she only drank a little tea, refusing the bread and cheese Lan tried to press on her, before curling up beside the fire. She seemed to fall asleep the instant she wrapped her cloak around her. The others, all save Lan, were dropping asleep wherever they could find a space to stretch out, but Rand could not imagine why. He felt as if he had already had a full night in a good bed. No sooner did he lean back against the log wall, though, than sleep rolled him under. When Lan poked him awake an hour later, he felt as though he had had three days' rest. The warder awakened them all, except Moraine, and he sternly hushed any sound that might disturb her. Even so, he allowed them only a short stay in the snug cave of trees. Before the sun was twice its own height above the horizon, all traces that anyone had ever stopped there had been cleared away, and they were all mounted and moving north toward Berlon, riding slowly to conserve the horses. The Aes Sedai's eyes were shadowed, but she sat her saddle upright and steady. Fog still hung thick over the river behind them, a gray wall resisting the efforts of the feeble sun to burn it away and hiding the two rivers from view. Rand watched over his shoulder as he rode, hoping for one last glimpse, even of Tarn Ferry, until the fog bank was lost to sight. I never thought I'd ever be this far from home, he said when the trees at last hid both the fog and the river. Remember when Watch Hill seemed a long way? Two days ago, that was. It seems like forever. In a month or two, we'll be back, Perrin said in a strained voice. Think what we'll have to tell. Even Trollocs can't chase us forever, Matt said. Burn me, they can't. He straightened around with a heavy sigh, slumping in his saddle as if he did not believe a word that had been said. Men, Egwene snorted. You get the adventure you're always prating about, and already you're talking about home. She held her head high, yet Rand noticed a tremor to her voice, now that nothing more was to be seen of the two rivers. Neither Moraine nor Lan made any attempt to reassure them, not a word to say that of course they would come back. He tried not to think on what that might mean. Even rested, he was full enough of doubts without searching for more. Hunching in his saddle, he began a waking dream of tending the sheep alongside Tam in a pasture with deep, lush grass and larks singing of a spring morning. And a trip into Emmons Field and Beltine the way it had been, dancing on the green, with never a care beyond whether he might stumble in the steps. He managed to lose himself in it for a long time. The journey to Berlon took almost a week. Lan muttered about the laggardness of their travel, but it was he who set the pace and forced the rest to keep it. With himself and his stallion Mondarb, he said it meant blade in the old tongue, he was not so sparing. The warder covered twice as much ground as they did, galloping ahead, his color shifting cloaks swirling in the wind to scout what lay before them, or dropping behind to examine their back trail. Any others who tried to move at more than a walk, though, got cutting words on taking care of their animals, biting words on how well they would do afoot if the Trollocs did appear. Not even Moraine was proof against his tongue if she let the white mare pick up her step. Aldib, the mare was called, and the old tongue, West Wind, the wind that brought the spring rains. The warder's scouting never turned up any sign of pursuit or ambush. He spoke only to Moraine of what he saw 
and that quietly, so it could not be overheard, and the Aes Sedai informed the rest of them of what she thought they needed to know. In the beginning, Rand looked over his shoulder as much as he did ahead. He was not the only one. Perrin fingered his axe often, and Matt rode with an arrow knocked to his bow in the beginning. But the land behind remained empty of Trollocs or figures in black cloaks. The sky remained empty of Drakkar. Slowly, Rand began to think perhaps they really had escaped. No very great cover was to be had, even in the thickest parts of the woods. Winter clung as hard north of the Tarn as it did to the two rivers. Stands of pine or fir or leather leaf, and here and there a few spice woods or laurels dotted a forest of otherwise bare gray branches. Not even the elders showed a leaf. Only scattered green sprigs of new growth stood out against brown meadows beaten flat by the winter's snows. Here, too, much of what did grow was stinging nettles and coarse thistle and stinkweed. On the bare dirt of the forest floor, some of the last snow still hung on, in shady patches and in drifts beneath the low branches of evergreens. Everyone kept their cloaks drawn well about them, for the thin sunlight had no warmth to it, and the night cold pierced deep. No more birds flew here than in the two rivers, not even ravens. There was nothing leisurely about the slowness of their movement. The North Road... Rand continued to think of it that way, though he suspected it might have a different name here, north of the Tarn. Still ran almost due north, but at Land's insistence, their path snaked this way and that through the forest as often as it ran along the hard-packed dirt road. A village or a farm or any sign of men or civilization sent them circling for miles to avoid it, though there were few enough of any of those. The whole first day, Rand saw no evidence aside from the road that men had ever been in that woods. It came to him that even had he gone to the foot of the Mountains of Mist, he might not have been as far from a human habitation as he was that day. The first farm he saw, a large frame house and tall barn with high-peaked thatched roofs, a curl of smoke rising from a stone chimney, was a shock. It's no different from back home, Perrin said, frowning at the distant buildings, barely visible through the trees. People moved around the farmyard, as yet unaware of the travelers. Of course it is, Matt said. We're just not close enough to see. I tell you, it's no different, Perrin insisted. It must be. We're north of the Tarn, after all. Quiet, you two, Lan growled. We don't want to be seen, remember? This way. He turned west to circle the farm through the trees. Looking back, Rand thought Perrin was right. The farm looked much the same as any around Emmons Field. There was a small boy toting water from the well, and older boys tending sheep behind a rail fence. It even had a curing shed for tabak. But Matt was right, too. We're north of the Tarn. It must be different. Always they halted while light still clung to the sky, to choose a spot sloped for drainage and sheltered from the wind that seldom died completely, only changed direction. Their fire was always small and hidden from only a few yards off, and once tea was brewed, the flames were doused and the coals buried. At their first stop before the sun sank, Lan began teaching the boys what to do with the weapons they carried. He started with the bow. After watching Matt put three arrows into a knot the size of a man's head on the fissured trunk of a dead leather leaf at a hundred paces, he told the others to take their turns. Perrin duplicated Matt's feet and Rand, summoning the flame in the void, the empty calm that let the bow become a part of him, or him of it, clustered his three where the points almost touched one another. Matt gave him a congratulatory clap on the shoulder. Now if you all had bows, the warder said dryly when they started grinning, and if the Trollocs agreed not to come so close you couldn't use them. The grins faded abruptly. Let me see what I can teach you in case they do come that close. He showed Perrin a bit of how to use that great bladed axe. Raising an axe to someone or something that had a weapon was not at all like chopping wood or flailing around in pretend. Setting the big apprentice blacksmith to a series of exercises, block, parry, and strike, he did the same for Rand and his sword. Not the wild leaping about and slashing that Rand had in mind whenever he thought about using it, but smooth motions, one flowing into another, almost a dance. Moving the blade is not enough, Lan said, though some think it is. The mind is part of it, most of it. Blank your mind, sheep herder. Empty it of hate or fear, of everything. Burn them away. You others listen to this too. You can use it with the axe or the bow, with a spear or a quarterstaff, or even your bare hands. Rand stared at him. 
The flame in the void, he said wonderingly. That's what you mean, isn't it? My father taught me about that. The warder gave him an unreadable look in return. Hold the sword as I showed you, sheepherder. I cannot make a mud-footed villager into a blade master in an hour, but perhaps I can keep you from slicing off your own foot. Rand sighed and held the sword upright before him in both hands. Moraine watched without expression, but the next evening she told Land to continue the lessons. The meal at evening was always the same as at midday and breakfast. Flat bread and cheese and dried meat, except that evenings they had hot tea to wash it down instead of water. Tom entertained them evenings. Lan would not let the gleeman play harp or flute, no need to rouse the countryside, the warder said, but Tom juggled and told stories. Mara and the Three Foolish Kings, or one of the hundreds about Anla, the wise counselor, or something filled with glory and adventure, like the Great Hunt of the Horn, but always with a happy ending and a joyous homecoming. Yet if the land was peaceful around them, if no Trollocs appeared among the trees, no Drakkar among the clouds, it seemed to Rand that they managed to raise their tension themselves whenever it was in danger of vanishing. There was the morning that Egwene awoke and began unbraiding her hair. Rand watched her from the corner of his eye as he made up his blanket roll. Every night when the fire was doused, everyone took to their blankets except for Egwene and the Aes Sedai. The two women always went aside from the others and talked for an hour or two, returning when the others were asleep. Egwene combed her hair out, one hundred strokes, he counted, while he was saddling Cloud, tying his saddlebags and blanket behind the saddle. Then she tucked the comb away, swept her loose hair over her shoulder, and pulled up the hood of her cloak. Startled, he asked, What are you doing? She gave him a sidelong look without answering. It was the first time he had spoken to her in two days, he realized, since the night in the log shelter on the bank of the Tarin. But he did not let that stop him. All your life you've wanted to wear your hair in a braid, and now you're giving it up? Why? Because she doesn't braid hers? I said I don't braid their hair, she said simply. At least, not unless they want to. You aren't an I said I. You're a Gwen Alvir from Emmons Field, and the women's circle will have a fit if they could see you now. Women's circle business is none of yours, Randolph Thor. And I will be an I said I, just as soon as I reach Tarvalin. He snorted. As soon as you reach Tarvalin? Why, like tell me that. You're no dark friend. Do you think Moraine Sadai is a dark friend? Do you? She squared around to face him with her fists clenched, and he almost thought she was going to hit him. After she saved the village? After she saved your father? I don't know what she is, but whatever she is, it doesn't say anything about the rest of them. The stories... Grow up, Rand. Forget the stories and use your eyes. My eyes saw her sink the ferry. Deny that. Once you get an idea in your head, you won't budge even if somebody points out you're trying to stand on water. You're such a light-blinded fool, you... Fool, am I? Let me tell you a thing or two, Randolph Thor. You are the muliest, most wool-headed... You two trying to wake everybody inside ten miles? The warder asked. Standing there with his mouth open, trying to get a word in edgewise, Rand suddenly realized he'd been shouting. They both had. Egwene's face went scarlet to her eyebrows, and she spun away with a muttered, Men. That seemed as much for the warder as for him. Warily, Rand looked around the camp. Everybody was looking at him, not just the warder. Matt and Perrin with their faces white. Tom tensed as if ready to run or fight. Moraine. The Aes Sedai's face was expressionless, but her eyes seemed to bore into his head. Desperately, he tried to recall exactly what he had said about Aes Sedai and dark friends. It is time to be going, Moraine said. She turned to Aldib, and Rand shivered as if he had been let out of a trap. He wondered if he had been. Two nights later, with the fire burning low, Matt said, You know, I think we've lost them for good. Lan was off in the night, taking a last look around. Moraine and Egwene had gone aside for one of their conversations. Tom was half-dozing over his pipe, and the young men had the fire to themselves. Perrin, idly poking the embers with a stick, answered, If we've lost them, why does Lan keep scouting? Nearly asleep, Rand rolled over, his back to the fire. We lost them back at Tarn Ferry. Matt lay back with his fingers, laced behind his head, staring at the moon-filled sky. If they were even really after us... 
You think that Drakkar was chasing us because it liked us? Perrin asked. I say stop worrying about Trollocs and such, Matt went on as if Perrin had not spoken, and start thinking about seeing the world. We're out where the stories come from. What do you think a real city is like? We're going to Berlon, Rand said sleepily, but Matt snorted. Berlon's all very well, but I've seen that old map Master Alvir has. If we turn south once we reach Camelon, the road leads all the way to Ilion and beyond. What's so special about Ilion? Perrin said, yawning. For one thing, Matt replied, Ilion isn't full of ice. A silence fell, and Rand was suddenly wide awake. Moraine had come back early. Egwene was with her, but it was the Aes Sedai standing at the edge of the firelight who held their attention. Matt lay there on his back, his mouth still open, staring at her. Moraine's eyes caught the light like dark, polished stones. Abruptly, Rand wondered how long she had been standing there. The lads were just... Tom began, but Moraine spoke right over the top of him. A few days' respite, and you are ready to give up. Her calm, level voice contrasted sharply with her eyes. A day or two of quiet, and already you have forgotten winter night. We haven't forgotten, Perrin said. It's just... Still not raising her voice, the eye said I treated him as she had the gleeman. Is that the way you all feel? You are all eager to run off to Ilion and forget about Trollocs and Halfmen and Drakkar. She ran her eyes over them. That stony glint playing against the everyday tone of voice made Rand uneasy. But she gave no one a chance to speak. The Dark One is after you three, one or all. And if I let you go running off wherever you want to go, he will take you. Whatever the Dark One wants, I oppose. So hear this and know it true. Before I let the Dark One have you, I will destroy you myself. It was her voice, so matter-of-fact, that convinced Rand. The Aes Sedai would do exactly what she said if she thought it was necessary. He had a hard time sleeping that night, and he was not the only one. Even the Gleeman did not begin snoring till long after the last coals died. For once, Moraine offered no help. Those nightly talks between Egwene and the Aes Sedai were a sore point for Rand. Whenever they disappeared into the darkness, aside from the rest for privacy, he wondered what they were saying, what they were doing. What was the Aes Sedai doing to Egwene? One night, he waited until the other men had all settled down, Tom snoring like a saw cutting an oak knot. Then he slipped away, clutching his blanket around him. Using every bit of skill he had gained stalking rabbits, he moved with the moon shadows until he was crouched at the base of a tall leather-leaf tree, thick with tough, broad leaves, close enough to hear Moraine and Egwene, where they had sat on a fallen log with a small lantern for light. Ask, Moraine was saying, and if I can tell you now, I will. Understand there is much for which you are not yet ready, things you cannot learn until you have learned other things which require still others to be learned before them. But ask what you will. The five powers, Egwene said slowly. Earth, wind, fire, water, and spirit. It doesn't seem fair that men should have been strongest in wielding earth and fire. Why should they have the strongest powers? Moraine laughed. Is that what you think, child? Is there a rock so hard that wind and water cannot wear it away? A fire so strong that water cannot quench it or wind snuff it out? Egwene was silent for a time, digging her toe into the forest floor. They... they were the ones who... who tried to free the Dark One and the Forsaken, weren't they? The male Aes Sedai. She took a deep breath and picked up speed. The women were not part of it. It was the men who went mad and broke the world. You are afraid, Moraine said grimly. If you had remained in Emmons Field, you would have become wisdom in time. That was Nynaeve's plan, was it not? Or you would have sat in the women's circle and managed the affairs of Emmons Field while the village council thought it was doing so. But you did the unthinkable. You left Emmons Field, left the two rivers seeking adventure. You wanted to do it, and at the same time you are afraid of it. And you are stubbornly refusing to let your fear best you. You would not have asked me how a woman becomes an Aes Sedai otherwise. You would not have thrown custom and convention over the fence otherwise. No, Egwene protested. I'm not afraid. I do want to become an Aes Sedai. Better for you if you were afraid. But I hope you'll hold to that conviction. 
Few women these days have the ability to become initiates, much less have the wish to. Moraine's voice sounded as if she had begun musing to herself. Surely never before two in one village. The old blood is indeed still strong in the two rivers. In the shadows, Rand shifted. A twig snapped under his foot. He froze instantly, sweating and holding his breath, but neither of the women looked around. Two, Egwene exclaimed. Who else? Is it Kari? Kari Thane? Laura Ayelin? Moraine gave an exasperated click of her tongue, then said sternly, You must forget I said that. Her road lies another way, I fear. Concern yourself with your own circumstances. It is not an easy road you have chosen. I will not turn back, Egwene said. Be that as it may. But you still want reassurance, and I cannot give it to you. Not in the way you want. I don't understand. You want to know that Aes Sedai are good and pure, that it was those wicked men of the legends who caused the breaking of the world, not the women. Well, it was the men, but they were no more wicked than any men. They were insane, not evil. The Aes Sedai you will find in Tar Valen are human, no different from any other women except for the ability that sets us apart. They are brave and cowardly, strong and weak, kind and cruel, warm-hearted and cold. Becoming an Aes Sedai will not change you from what you are. Egwene drew a heavy breath. I suppose I was afraid of that, that I'd be changed by the power. That and the Trollocs, and the Fade, and... Maureen Sedai, in the name of light, why did the Trollocs come to Emmons Field? The Aes Sedai's head swung, and she looked straight at Rand's hiding place. His breath seized in his throat. Her eyes were as hard as when she had threatened them, and he had the feeling they could penetrate the leather leaf's thick branches. Light, what will she do if she finds me listening? He tried to melt back into the deeper shadows. With his eyes on the women, a root snagged his foot, and he barely caught himself from tumbling into dead brush that would have pointed him out with a crackle of snapping branches like fireworks. Panting, he scrambled away on all fours, keeping silent as much by luck as by anything he did. His heart pounded so hard he thought that might give him away itself. Fool. Eavesdropping on an Aes Sedai. Back where the others were sleeping, he managed to slip in among them silently. Land moved as he dropped to the ground and jerked his blanket up, but the warder settled back with a sigh. He had only been rolling over in his sleep. Rand let out a long, silent breath. A moment later, Moraine appeared out of the night, stopping where she could study the slumbering shapes. Moonlight made a nimbus around her. Rand closed his eyes and breathed evenly, all the while listening hard for footsteps coming closer. None did. When he opened his eyes again, she was gone. When finally sleep came, it was fitful and filled with sweaty dreams where all the men in Emmonsfield claimed to be the dragon reborn and all the women had blue stones in their hair like the one Moraine wore. He did not try to overhear Moraine and Egwene again. On into the sixth day, the slow journey stretched. The warmthless sun slid slowly toward the treetops while a handful of thin clouds drifted high to the north. The wind gusted higher for a moment, and Rand pulled his cloak back up onto his shoulders, muttering to himself. He wondered if they would ever get to Berlon. The distance they had traveled from the river already was more than enough to take him from Tarn Ferry to the White River, but Lan always said it was just a short journey whenever he was asked, hardly worth calling a journey at all. It made him feel lost. Lan appeared ahead of them in the woods, returning from one of his forays. He reined in and rode beside Moraine, his head bent close to hers. Rand grimaced, but he did not ask any questions. Lan simply refused to acknowledge all such questions aimed at him. Only Egwene among the others even appeared to notice Lan's return, so used to this arrangement had they become, and she kept back too. The Aes Sedai might have been acting as if Egwene were in charge of the Emmonsfielders, but that gave her no say when the warder made his reports. Perrin was carrying Matt's bow, wrapped in the thoughtful silence that seemed to take them all more and more as they got further from the two rivers. The horse's slow walk allowed Matt to practice juggling three stones under Tom Marilyn's watchful eye. The Gleeman had given lessons each night, too, as well as Lan. Lan finished whatever he had been telling Moraine, and she twisted in her saddle to look back at the others. Rand tried not to stiffen when her eyes moved across him. Did they linger on him a moment longer than on anyone else? 
He had the queasy feeling that she knew who had been listening in the darkness that night. Hey, Rand, Matt called. I can juggle four. Rand waved in reply without looking around. I told you I'd get to four before you. I... Look! They had topped a low hill, and below them, a scant mile away, through the stark trees and the stretching shadows of evening, lay bare lawn. Rand gasped, trying to smile and gape at the same time. A log wall nearly twenty feet tall surrounded the town, with wooden watchtowers scattered along its length. Within, rooftops of slate and tile glinted with the sinking sun, and feathers of smoke drifted upward from chimneys. Hundreds of chimneys. There was not a thatched roof to be seen. A broad road ran east from the town, and another west— each with at least a dozen wagons and twice as many ox carts trudging toward the palisade. Farms lay scattered about the town, thickest to the north, while only a few broke the forest to the south. But they might as well not have existed as far as Rand was concerned. It's bigger than Emmons Field and Watch Hill and Devon Ride all put together. And maybe Tar and Ferry, too. So that's a city, Matt breathed, leaning forward across his horse's neck to stare. Perrin could only shake his head. How can so many people live in one place? Egwene simply stared. Tom Marilyn glanced at Matt, then rolled his eyes and blew out his mustaches. City, he snorted. And you, Rand? Moraine said. What do you think of your first sight of Bear Lawn? I think it's a long way from home, he said slowly, bringing a sharp laugh from Matt. You have further to go yet, Moraine said. Much further. But there is no other choice except to run and hide and run again for the rest of your lives. And short lives they would be. You must remember that when the journey becomes hard. You have no choice. Rand exchanged glances with Matt and Perrin. By their faces, they were thinking the same thing he was. How could she talk as if they had any choice after what she had said? The Aes Sedai made our choices. Moraine went on as if their thoughts were not plain. The danger begins again here. Watch what you say within those walls. Above all, do not mention Trollocs or Halfmen or any such. You must not even think of the Dark One. Some in Berlon have even less love for Aes Sedai than do the people of Emmons Field. And there may even be Dark Friends. Egwene gasped and Perrin muttered under his breath. Matt's face paled, but Moraine went on calmly. We must attract as little attention as possible. Lan was exchanging his cloak of shifting greys and greens for one of dark brown, more ordinary, though of fine cut and weave. His color-changing cloak made a large bulge in one of his saddlebags. We do not go by our own names here, Moraine continued. Here, I am known as Alice, and Lan is Andra. Remember that. Good. Let us be within the walls before night catches us. The gates of Berlon are closed from sundown to sunrise. Lan led the way down the hill and through the woods toward the log wall. The road passed half a dozen farms, none lay close, and none of the people finishing their chores seemed to notice the travelers. Ending at heavy wooden gates bound with wide straps of black iron. They were closed tight, even if the sun was not down yet. Lan rode close to the wall and gave a tug to a frayed rope hanging down beside the gates. A bell clanged on the other side of the wall. Abruptly, a wizened face under a battered cloth cap peered down suspiciously from atop the wall, glaring between the cut-off ends of two of the logs, a good three spans over their heads. Hurts all this, eh? It's too late in the day to be opening this gate. Too late, I say. Go around to the White Bridge Gate if you want to. Moraine's mare moved out to where the man atop the wall had a clear view of her. Suddenly his wrinkles deepened in a gap-toothed smile, and he seemed to quiver between speaking and doing his duty. I didn't know it was you, mistress. Wait, I'll be right down. Just wait. I'm coming, I'm coming. The head dipped out of sight, but Rand could still hear muffled shouts for them to stay where they were, that he was coming. With great creaks of disuse, the right-hand gate slowly swung outward. It stopped when opened just wide enough for one horse to pass through at a time, and the gatekeeper poked his head into the gap, flashed his half-toothless smile at them again, and darted back out of the way. Moraine followed Lan through, with Egwene right behind her. 
Rand trotted Cloud after Bella and found himself in a narrow street fronted by high wooden fences and warehouses, tall and windowless. Broad doors closed up tight. Moiraine and Lan were already on foot speaking to the wrinkle-faced gatekeeper, so Rand dismounted too. The little man, in a much-mended cloak and coat, held his cloth cap crumpled in one hand and ducked his head whenever he spoke. He peered at those dismounting behind Lan and Moiraine and shook his head. Down country folk, he grinned. Why, Mistress Ellis, you taking up collecting down country folk with hay in their hair? His look took in Tom Marilyn then. You ain't a sheep farmer. I remember letting you go through some days back, I do. Didn't like your tricks down country, eh, Gleeman? I hope you remember to forget letting us through, Master Ovin, Lance said, pressing a coin into the man's free hand. And letting us back in, too. No need for that, Master Andra. No need for that. You give me plenty when you went out. Plenty! Just the same, Avin made the coin disappear as deftly as if he were a gleeman, too. I ain't told nobody, and I won't neither. Especially not them white cloaks, he finished with a scowl. He pursed up his lips to spit, then glanced at Moraine and swallowed instead. Rand blinked but kept his mouth shut. The others did, too, though it appeared to be an effort for Matt. Children of the Light, Rand thought wonderingly. Stories told about the children by peddlers and merchants and merchants' guards varied from admiration to hatred, but all agreed the children hated Aes Sedai as much as they did Dark Friends. He wondered if this was more trouble already. The children are in Berlon, Land demanded. They surely are, the gatekeeper bobbed his head. Came the same day you left, as I recall. Ain't nobody here likes them at all. Most don't let on, of course. Have they said why they are here? Moraine asked intently. Why they're here, mistress? Avin was so astonished he forgot to duck his head. Of course they said why. Oh, I forgot. You've been down country. Likely you ain't heard nothing but sheep bleating. They say they're here because of what's going on down in Giladan. A dragon, you know. Well, him is calls himself dragon. They say the fellow's stirring up evil, which I expect he is. And they're here to stamp it out. Only he's down there in Giladan, not here. Just an excuse to meddle in other people's business is what I figure. There's already been the dragon's fang on some people's doors. This time he did spit. Have they caused much trouble then? Lance said, and Avin shook his head vigorously. Not that they don't want to, I expect. Only the governor don't trust them no more than I do. He won't let but maybe ten or so inside the walls at one time. And ain't they mad about that? The rest of it camp a little ways north, I hear. Bet they got the farmers looking over their shoulders. The ones that do come in, they just stalk around in those white cloaks looking down their noses at honest folk. Walk in the light, they say, and it's an order. Near come to blows more than once with the wagoneers and miners and smelters and all. And even the watch... But the governor wants it all peaceful, and that's how it's been so far. If they're hunting evil, I say, why aren't they up in Saldea? There's some kind of trouble up there, I hear. Or down in Giladan. There's been a big battle down there, they say. Real big. Moraine drew a soft breath. I had heard that Aes Sedai were going to Giladan. Yes, they did, mistress. Ovin's head started bobbing again. They went to Giladan, all right. And that's what started this battle or so, I hear. They say some of those Aes Sedai are dead. Maybe all of them. I know some folks don't hold with Aes Sedai, but I say, who else is going to stop a false dragon, eh? And those damn fools who think they can be men Aes Sedai or some such, what about them? Of course, some say, not the White Cloak's mind and not me, but some folks, that maybe this fellow really is the Dragon Reborn. He can do things, I hear. Use the one power. There's thousands following him. Don't be a fool, Lan snapped, and Avin's face folded into a hurt look. I'm only saying what I heard, ain't I? Just what I heard, Master Andra. They say, some do, that he's moving his army east and south toward Tyr. His voice became heavy with meaning. They say he's named them the people of the dragon. Names mean little, Moraine said calmly. 
If anything she had heard disturbed her, she gave no outward sign of it now. You could call your mule people of the dragon if you wanted. Not likely, mistress, Avin chuckled. Not with the white cloaks around for sure. I don't expect anybody else would look kindly on a name like that neither. I see what you mean, but... Oh, no, mistress. Not my mule. No doubt a wise decision, Moraine said. Now we must be off. And don't you worry, mistress, Avin said with a deep bob of his head. I ain't seen nobody. He darted to the gate and began tugging it closed with quick jerks. Ain't seen nobody and ain't seen nothing. The gate thudded shut and he pulled down the locking bar with a rope. In fact, mistress, this gate ain't been open in days. The light illumine you, Avin, Moraine said. She led them away from the gate then. Rand looked back once, and Avin was still standing in front of the gate. He seemed to be polishing a coin with an edge of his cloak and chuckling. The way led through dirt streets, barely the width of two wagons, empty of people, all lined with warehouses and occasional high wooden fences. Rand walked a time beside the gleeman. Tom, what was all that about Tyr and the people of the dragon? Tyr is a city all the way down on the Sea of Storms, isn't it? The Carathon Cycle, Tom said curtly. Rand blinked. The prophecies of the dragon? Nobody tells the... Those stories in the two rivers. Not in Emmons Field, anyway. The wisdom would skin them alive if they did. I suppose she would at that, Tom said dryly. He glanced at Moraine up ahead with Lan, saw she could not overhear, and went on. Tyr is the greatest port on the Sea of Storms, and the Stone of Tyr is the fortress that guards it. The stone is said to be the first fortress built after the breaking of the world, and in all this time it has never fallen though more than one army has tried. One of the prophecies says that the Stone of Tyr will never fall until the people of the dragon come to the stone. Another says the stone will never fall till the sword that cannot be touched is wielded by the dragon's hand. Tom grimaced. The fall of the stone will be one of the major proofs that the dragon has been reborn. May the stone stand till I am dust. The sword that cannot be touched... That's what it says. I don't know whether it is a sword. Whatever it is, it lies in the heart of the stone, the central citadel of the fortress. None but the High Lords of Tyr can enter there. They never speak of what lies inside. Certainly not the Gleeman, anyway. Rand frowned. The stone cannot fall until the dragon wields the sword. But how can he unless the stone has already fallen? Is the dragon supposed to be a High Lord of Tyr? Not much chance of that, the Gleeman said dryly. Tyr hates anything to do with the power even more than Amador, and Amador is the stronghold of the Children of the Light. Then how can the prophecy be fulfilled? Rand asked. I'd like it well enough if the dragon was never reborn, but a prophecy that cannot be fulfilled doesn't make much sense. It sounds like a story meant to make people think the dragon never will be reborn. Is that it? You ask an awful lot of questions, boy, Tom said. A prophecy that was easily fulfilled would not be worth much, now would it? Suddenly his voice brightened. Well, we're here, wherever here is. Lan had stopped by a section of high wooden fence that looked no different from any other they had passed. He was working the blade of his dagger between two of the boards. Abruptly, he gave a grunt of satisfaction, pulled, and a length of fence swung out like a gate. In fact, it was a gate, Rand saw though one meant to be opened only from the other side. The metal latch that Land had lifted with his dagger showed that. Moraine went through immediately, drawing Aldib behind her. Land motioned the others to follow and brought up the rear, closing the gate behind him. On the other side of the fence, Rand found himself in the stable yard of an inn. A loud bustle and clatter came from the building's kitchen, but what struck him was its size. It covered more than twice as much ground as the wine spring inn, and was four stories high besides. Well over half the windows were aglow in the deepening twilight. He wondered at this city that could have so many strangers in it. No sooner had they come well into the stable yard than three men in dirty canvas aprons appeared at the huge stable's broad arched doors. One, a wiry fellow, and the only one without a manure fork in his hands, came forward waving his arms. Here, here! You can't come in that way. You'll have to go around the front. 
Lan's hand went to his purse again, but even as it did, another man, as big around as Master Alvere, came hurrying out of the inn. Puffs of hair stuck out above his ears, and his sparkling white apron was as good as a sign proclaiming him the innkeeper. "'It's all right, much,' the newcomer said. "'It's all right. These folk are expected guests. Take care of their horses now. Good care.' Much sullenly knuckled his forehead, then motioned his two companions to come help. Rand and the others hurriedly got their saddlebags and blanket rolls down, while the innkeeper turned to Moraine. He gave her a deep bow and spoke with a genuine smile. Welcome, Mistress Alice. Welcome. It's good to be seeing you. You and Master Andrew both. Very good. Your fine conversation has been missed. Yes, it has. I must say I worried you going down country and all. Well, I mean, at a time like this, with the weather all crazy and wolves howling right up to the walls in the night. Abruptly, he slapped both hands against his round belly and shook his head. Here I go on like this, chattering away instead of taking you inside. Come, come, hot meals and warm beds, that's what you'll be wanting. And the best in Berlon are right here, the very best. And hot baths too, I trust, Master Fitch, Moraine said, and Egwene echoed her fervently. Oh, yes. Baths, the innkeeper said. Why, just the best and the hottest in Berlon. Come, welcome to the stag and lion. Welcome to Berlon. <laughs>